we just, um, Joe Bradley's going to be coming. She just had to run down the hall for a minute. And we're going to get a, a quick overview on the farm walls and farm economy and how that's all doing. <coughs> uh, I just had a meeting with them and some people from the co-op. Uh, Mm -hmm. Our chair appropriations. Is that why I saw Leo Graves? Pardon? Is that why I saw Leo? Yeah. Graves? Well, he's right here. Oh, he's hey, hiding from Good to see you. Okay. Good to see you. 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 Good to you. Good to see you. Good to see you. You look sure. right there, Joe. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. I feel Your right hand leans frontwards as well. Mine leans frontwards. No, no, actually, it seems like it leans back towards yeah. the back. Perfect. Uh, did you have someone else? Uh, I did. I had um, Jason Kimberly, who's there. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, anyways, we'll call a meeting to order. We're a little bit late getting started, but uh, uh, we've been working. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so I want to introduce uh, Joe Bradley uh, from that County. Senator Collimore from Rutland County. Oh, nice to meet you. Yes. You know Hello. Carolyn? Yes. And Mr. Brooks. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. And I thought that it would be good to hear uh, uh, Joe and Vita do a lot of farm mm -hmm. work. And I thought it'd be good See to hear you know, uh, the big picture of just how things are from their perspective back on the farms. And, and, uh, and then uh, we'll move on to some of our bills. But it would be good to get an overview. Or, and I don't know how you want to do Well, that. I can start off, but I, I'd really you, like Jameson to come and well, see you. Well, you can bring a chair right okay. up here with you. That'd be Joe. great. Thank you. Jameson is our senior agricultural lender, yeah. and uh, he has a lot of experience. He worked at FSA before he came to us, and um, so spends a lot of time out on the farm with farmers, and I thought that it would be good for, for you to hear from someone who's actually out on the farm. I'm not out on the farm much, I'm mostly in the office, but let me just start from a, from a management perspective at VAC. Um, there is a great deal of difficulty um, in the farm sector, primarily due to the milk price. Due to the milk price, yeah. And it's been a longer period of time this time where the milk price has been lower. With the ag industry, and you know more about this, I think. I, well, no, I actually have been there 20 years. I, I do know quite a bit about it, don't I? So, you know, it's been a cycle like this and now it's like this for a long period of time and so a lot of the farmers have gotten themselves in significant debt. Uh, we do a lot of restructuring of their balance sheets and their debts already um, but I think they're going to need some significant assistance. Uh, back in 2009 we did a program called the Farm Operating Loan Program which uh, gave them a low interest rate for a couple of years and gave them some cash flow relief. Um, and we're looking at possibly doing the same sort of thing, but with a longer period and a larger dollar amount because some of the bills that are out there now are quite staggering, um, especially for the larger farms. Um, we do about, uh, I don't know if you want to know about VitaVac, but we do about 20 million um, a year in farm lending. Um, million a year. Million a year. Yeah. In just Vermont? In just Vermont, yes. The only in Vermont. Now we do deal with out-of-state banks sometimes. Um, not often in the farm sector. More that, the you must sector. be one of the larger we farm are. lenders. We are because so many banks, as you know, have gotten out of farm lending. So there's FSA, there's Yankee Farm Credit, and there's VAC. Um, our portfolio is well, I don't know how you'd compare our risk with FSA because, you know, they have a lot of longer term funding, up to 40 years in some cases, that really stretches 
So, I, you know, I think their risk is, is probably comparable to ours. I don't know, Jameson, what do you think about that? But our portfolio is certainly more risky than a Yankee Farm credit. You know, Yankee takes the better credits, and we take the credits that often need help. And we work with them a long time. We're not like a bank where we have to write it off immediately. So we have some farmers, I'm embarrassed to say this, but we've worked with for years and stretched them out and stretched them out. Um, and eventually we get paid off. Um, the thing about farmers, I think, that I've learned is they will find a way to pay their bills somehow. Um, and I said that one meeting several years ago and a farmer came up to me the other maybe two weeks ago and said, I remember you said that about farmers and I was really happy you said that. And, but it's absolutely true. And you look at their living expenses, um, it's amazing what they, you know, put on their income statement for their living expenses. It's much less than any of us would ever imagine being able to live on. Um, having said all that, um, VAC is, is going to do fine. We have collateral. Oftentimes, you know, we take the farm, so that includes the house. Um, nobody wants to lose their house, so um, we are often able to, um, they're often able to sell their land, their cows, and keep their house and pay us. Back. And we will often stretch that out too and allow them to pay us every time. We have had some auctions lately, um, more than we certainly normally have had. Um, it was a big one. Uh, we didn't, I don't know what we lost on it, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars. Not that that's not substantial, but um, I think we're going to see more losses. But we can we can weather that. We have enough reserves to. to what that. about the uh, loss ratio? Uh, you know, or default. Yeah, it's it, unbelievably, that? Senator Starr. It is under one percent. It still is. That it good? still is. Now, I'm not going to say it's going to stay there, but it's significantly under one percent. That's pretty it's amazing. Damn good that's what I mean about them finding the, the way to, <coughs> to pay us and pay their bills. It may take them a long time, but um, you know we're lucky we're not we're not fed, federally regulated, so we can work with yeah, our customers yeah. longer. Yeah. So that's I guess it from just an overall management perspective. Um, I'm not worried. Um, I think there does need to be something done to, as we've done in the past, to help um, with some cash flow relief in the in the first couple of years uh, to help them you know, pay their grain bills, uh, get their crops in the ground. That's the most important thing right now. So they got to pay the grain bill um, dealer a little something so they can get their grain for next year. So Jameson, if you don't mind, if anybody has any questions for me, I'm happy to, to take yeah, them. Yeah, well, we can hear from Jameson. Sure. Um, you know, I do. I'm out on the ground um, every day. I see a lot of stress especially in the dairy industry, but in agriculture in general, in general in the state. Um, this most stress is, you know, a lot of these farms are family farms. You know, you, you sit down with them at their dining room table to eat. You know, their kids are playing in the background. It's um, in some other commercial businesses I've led to. You're meeting with them at their place of business, typically. Um, so that there's a significant amount of stress, there's a significant amount of stress on farms' balance sheets right now. I'm seeing a lot of balance sheets where they have not yet paid for last year's inputs for their crop expenses, let alone determine how they're going to finance this year's crop expenses, which is coming up. Um, I was looking at milk checks yesterday and I saw a milk check on one farm. They received it's a pretty good farm and they received over $18.50 a hundredweight on their milk in January. Um, and then saw their check for March and it's down 15 so you can see a difference and you can see where a farm can fall behind quickly when there's a fluctuation like that in checks three dollars um, in the two month span so um, now a lot of farms can handle that if it was a one month thing but what we have seen now since 2016 which was an okay year uh, but not great cycle has been going down and then last year came up a little bit but for certainly not enough to allow any time for people to catch up so um, 
that's what we're seeing. Um, there's a significant need for working capital, um, or we will have more farms that are unable to get their crops in the ground this year. And if you can't get your crops in the ground, then you can't feed your animals. So we had a pretty bad overall year in certain parts of the states for crop production last year, and that has hurt farms in a multiple ways. They, they're stretching the inventories they have currently, which has an impact on the feed costs, but also milk production. Um, if they have to stretch their feed until the fall, if they're able to have another harvest, then um, it certainly is most likely either impacting milk production or it's costing more grain and concentrates to keep that production up. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but that's really where we're at today. What do you see as an average cost of production? Um, without factoring in debt repayment, I would say cost of production varies between $17 and $18, $19. Depending on the amount of leverage a farm has, you can add 2 or $3 a hundred weight on that for, for debt. Um, not all farms have that level of debt, but we are seeing quite a bit of it. So I would say with debt in there, probably $18 to $20. So when you're getting $15 a hundred weight, you're falling behind very quickly. <laughs> uh, we, we also have, and I should introduce Liam as a former senator and now works for St. Albans Co-op. Um, and what, detouring a little bit, uh, what maybe Liam you'd like to jump in and what are you seeing at the uh, co-op level? Sure, uh, thank you, and thank you for having me in here this morning. It's great to see you all again, um, and thank you for taking the time to hear from us on this. Uh, I also uh, serve on the VEDA Back Board. been there for, what, 22, three years now, so I've seen a lot of cycles. Uh, former dairy farmer for 22 years myself, so I understand it from the farm uh, perspective as well, but uh, just by way of background, St. Albans Cooperative has about 370 members. Uh, we produce about 1.3 billion pounds of milk um, as a cooperative uh, with a processing plant up there and, and a milk calling company, farm store, that's a bit about our business. Um, but we are seeing a tremendous amount of stress. Um, a significant number of our producers since January have gotten no milk checks at all because of the assignments and the payments uh, that come out of the checks before uh, we, we issue the final milk check to them. Uh, uh, you know, Jameson put it well, if you look at average cost of production, it's right on the money between 18 to $20, and it can be more than that, significantly more than that, uh, depending on debt level, production per cow, uh, with a milk price that was advanced uh, the most recent pay period, just slightly over $14. And you take $14 and you take the milk hauling away from that, the fees for balancing the oversupply of milk that we have away from that, equity, dues. Um, we're seeing uh, farmers with milk checks depending on if they get any premiums and what their components are in that, uh, you know, getting that $14, as James said, both $15 range against the most minimal production cost of 18. So, uh, we're seeing a tremendous amount of stress. Uh, we do a lot in trying to support our members and trying to uh, finance uh, inputs because we do sell feed, seed, fertilizer. Um, we sell that, right? We do, we do sell it and or we market it through other vendors, yeah. but farmers do have the ability to buy it through sale and go up and then expense it out over the year but with our business at the end of the year they do have to pay it off as well because we can't as a cooperative carry that long term going forward and that's where uh the full program the farm operating line program can be helpful not not for us right now because we're not in that that cycle with them but uh you know our farmers need to have their uh, expenses paid off with us either by the end of our fiscal year or the end of the calendar year and then you know we start over again with them but number of farmers with no milk checks, uh, farmers who have not satisfied the input costs for the 2017 crop, now need to put a crop in the ground for 2018. Uh, 
I do see uh, some very, very modest improvement in mill prices on the back half of this year, but it's very modest. And the, the big drag on the market and the biggest problem, obviously, is the price of milk. And there is a significant oversupply, especially of non fat dry milk powder on the market, not only nationally, but internationally as well. And that's what's keeping the overall price of milk down. Um, unless in our, well, that will, will eventually clear the market. And my biggest concern is having our members and our farmers in Vermont have the ability to satisfy some of their credit needs right now to be able to get a crop in the ground for 18 and hopefully be there when milk prices come back. That's always the issue. You know, we used to traditionally be in a three year cycle. Uh, we saw a record high milk price in 2014. Farmers in this state and nationally responded to that. That's why we have the significant surplus that we're still working off of, believe it or not. And uh, so we are in a very, very, it's almost some economists would say a double dip recession in terms of milk prices because you usually, you, every, every third year, if you look back over the last dozen years, every third year was a, a low milk price but a record high on top of it. So we kept stair stepping up, you know, in terms of overall milk prices. But, um, it's, it's, it's tough out there. There's a lot of despair. I mean, our, our membership folks in St. Albans Co-op are working with farmers on an ongoing basis. Uh, if you look at the loan servicing and the things that uh, Jameson and his team does head back, uh, just to continue to try to you know work with farmers. Uh, so something like the Farm Operating Line Program, like we visited about earlier today, could be very, very helpful to provide some cash flow relief. It would be uh, most appreciated by our farmers. We've got probably oh, five or six farms right now that have announced that they're going to have auctions. And we're, I mean, we, we start to total that up for, for the viability of our business and our farmers' business. Uh, several million pounds of milk production will be lost this year. Now, in some cases, it goes to the neighboring farm, but you know, we do see a significant loss in overall production as well, which will impact our uh, ability to serve our customers and having been in the milk business a long time, the difficulty of this as well, we're in a long oversupply that we've been in for quite a while. Milk will go short just as quick as it went long and then we're gonna be clamoring to find milk to supply our customers and our biggest customer is you know, Labor Ben and Jerry's. Uh, they have significant needs. They just you know expanded their processing facilities. Uh, we supply milk to a lot of processors in this state. So that maintenance of that 1.23 billion that's part of our milk supply is critical not only to our farmers and our cooperative, but to the processors and the customers that we supply. And then the final thing I would say is uh, there's a tremendous amount of stress. And I, I would urge you, if you want to, and if you start to go down the road of supporting a program like this, bring a couple, three of the input suppliers in that have a tremendous amount, millions and millions of dollars of credit on the books right now for feed, seed, and fertilizer. And there's a lot of stress on that side of the uh, economy as well, as well as custom operators. We're losing a big farm and custom operator in Franklin County here with an auction next week. So those are the kinds of things that start to get at the core a bit of, of the you know, dairy industry in Vermont overall. And it, it's so critical to our economy the travel and tourism industry, uh, maintaining our open landscape. I know you know all this, uh, but it, we're at a critical point right now. Yeah, so thank so you. Have, you, know, what, you mentioned a record high price. Just curious, how high is it in the last couple of years? In, in 2014, we saw uh, farms that were not organic farms, that were conventional farms with good quality and good components get close to $30 a hundred. Really? Yeah. Where, where, the, where the norm would normally be, you know, somewhere in that twenty dollar range now, based on you know where production costs are, you know, between eighteen and twenty one, twenty two. Yeah. Uh, that the year total supply of milk one point two billion pound. How many trailer loads or trailer truck loads would that be? Well, you you do the math at about uh, fifty seven to sixty thousand pounds uh, a load. So. You know, I know our milk was all over the place. So we had 50, 60 loads of milk a day that just comes into our plant. Then we have milk that goes to, uh, a fair bit of milk that goes to Commonwealth. We have milk that goes to uh, several of the Dean Foods fluid processing plants. And uh, uh, we have milk that goes
goes to the Agrimark plants and all over the place. Right? So 60, 70 logs maybe yeah. a day. Yeah. Tractor trailer. And that's seven days a week. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's a, you know, it's a lot of milk that keeps a lot of people working besides just the farm. Yeah, we've got a couple hundred jobs right at Sid Alvin's Co-op between our milk calling company and the plant. Yeah, um, I think the, the other thing to know, the organic side of the industry is struggling right now too. We've got about 100 organic farmers and or the organic farmers are seeing, due to oversupply as well, they're seeing some bases or production quotas put in place on their farms as well as their their uh, payment programs being cut by two to three dollars a hundred weeks. So their and their production costs are so much higher. So their their you know P and L's not looking great right now. In fact we've had we've had some organic farmers who have requested to come back to the conventional side of the business and of course we do take them you know back as conventional farmers. So. I appreciate everything you have just shared, and coming from Franklin County, you know as well as I do that we are on, we are teetering on a crisis up there. If if enough farmers go out to sink the whole the whole rural economy, these providers who are providing seed and fertilizer, the veterinarians, the machinery dealers, that's really the backbone of Franklin County, and I I. Um, can foresee a, a really an economic disaster up there if, if uh, a significant amount of these farms go out and we are seeing it and everybody reads the auction page and it's it's um, really something that we, we need to take action on but um, have, by the same token it's frustrating because there's little we can do about it. Some of us were talking earlier this morning about um, coming up with a way to regulate the amount of milk so I, I just have a question. I apologize for asking it right here in the open session, but is there any way the co-op can start its own um, uh, cap on the amount of milk uh, produced? Like, uh, you know, next month we're going to pick up 5% less milk from you than we picked up this month. Something like that to force farmers uh, to not be producing so much milk. Can they? Can they Hold it together. If, first off, if we did that, and if we did do it, what happens to the co-op? Can you guys hold your PL statements together? What have you thought the, of doing that? The the only way a program like that could work in an ideal situation, it needs to be a national program. Right. Uh, and we worked. I've been working for co-ops since I left the Commissioner of Ag's office. I've been working for co-ops uh, mm -hmm. full time, and we spent seven years teeing up a program that was a two-pronged program, the Margin Protection Program, which we have now at the federal level, and there was a, a growth management program, supply management program, coupled with that based on margin. And the two could have, would have worked beautifully together. Unfortunately, it's a story longer than we have time for here. After getting it we know to the, story, yeah. the floor twice in Washington, in the Senate, and passed, in the house once it passed, it got killed in the house. The growth management piece got pulled out, and we ended up with margin protection, which, as you know, has been a very ineffective program based on the way it was put together. So, and, and fortunately, we've, we've seen we've just seen some improvements in that program that Senator Lady and others have worked on to get through that will help a little bit. Uh, the The issue of growth management, supply management on a regional or co-op by co-op basis has to be a non-starter. The reason it's a non-starter is we could, let's say for argument's sake, based on what you said, we could at Sid Alvin's co-op uh, pay our farmers for 95% of their production thinking that we're going to incent them to make less milk to raise the overall price. Unfortunately, it would have absolutely no impact on the overall price of milk, no impact whatsoever. Now let's move it to the regional level. Let's say, for argument's sake, our our partner competitor, other co-ops in the Northeast decided to try to do something like that. It's it's difficult at best because, unfortunately, milk moves. Manufactured products move all over the country, the U.S. and all over the world. So, you you will move milk and milk products to an area where there is not a sufficient supply. So. That in and of itself is, is a problem as well. And at the end of the day, 
if any one cooperative or even cooperatives in a region were to do this, the bigger challenge is when you come out of the oversupply situation, somebody else has your customers. And it's a, it's a complicated set of dynamics. Um, it, it could work at the national level. We're exporting 15, 16% of our total US production right now. And thank God we are. And if anything happens to NAFTA, or anything happens with the Chinese, or customers in the Asian ramp, we are in big trouble in this country. Because in 09, what really happened in 09, we had about 1.5% of that export product come back onto the domestic market. And for about 18 months, every farmer farming here lost about $100 per cow per month for about 18 months. So today, we're in a similar situation. Exports are still strong right now, but if anything happens with the exports, we're in big trouble. And the bigger problem that we have is our farmers today probably have lost 50% of their equity in their cattle machinery right now. And that's what starts to create some of the issues from any lender from an underwriting standpoint as well. So um, it, it, it's complicated and there's no easy quick fix. And unfortunately, we, and I used to work on this a lot in my former uh, life here in this building and as Commissioner of Agriculture, as hard as we <coughs> work on it and want to try to affect the milk price, the underlying root cause of the problem, we do not have the ability to do that because of you know the way the How way milk is marketed. So right now, I think the, the most beneficial thing that we could do is to support the development or the reestablishment of the Farmers Operating Line program both in, and, and figure out if there's a way that we can underwrite the cost of that so that the, the Vermont Ag Credit Corporation can get some you know, operating money out there to help farmers uh, over, over the hump. And let's hope it's over the hump. And let's hope we're on the back side of this milk price situation and that we're seeing price, going to see some improved prices you know later this year and <laughs> if they're not able to get through this spring it's a move point down the road so you know, we're trying to to give farmers the opportunity to try to move forward a little bit this spring and why why i invited these folks in because um, we're all on different committees the rest of the day those those committee members that you sit with in the afternoon, most of them haven't got a clue what's really going on out there in the rural parts of the state. And I think as as the ag committee, um, you know, we have an obligation to inform our our Senate colleagues that how important. Uh, this issue is and when it comes up on the floor uh, if we can get it there um, you know you've got to have some support in, and and uh, you know the hopefully the governor uh, I know he and some of his people are, are also talking about about this and so hopefully you know we can make this a uh, a full, uh, full effort uh, from all involved and in, in get this done. Uh, we can't, we can't drag into midsummer. We really need to fire this thing up as soon as possible uh, for morale's sake and for spring planting. There's a come on in, Nancy. We're just talking about a subject that that you might have some concern with. No, no Bobby, before, that's, what is the this we're talking about? Pardon? What is the this we're talking about? You say we want to ramp this up. Is it a particular program or is an idea that we're playing with? Well, yeah, Joe can tell you, what, that's what we met real early about. Well, back in 2009, we did a program called the Farm Operating Loan Program. Um, and what it did at that point was provide uh, money for feed, seed, and getting people's crops in the ground. This year we would um, envision doing a similar program, but also um, 
with consolidation of some of the debts they already have on their balance sheet. Yeah. So we're looking at doing perhaps $10 million of lending, $150,000 would be the um, maximum loan amount. We would um, subsidize their rate for two years so they have a cash flow relief in the first couple of years. So we would take their interest rate down to three and a half for the first two years. Down to what? Three and a half <clears throat> from our typical rate right now is five and a half. So that's a 2% subsidy. Um, and we're thinking the program in 2009 was a, was a three year program. Where things are now, I think we should do a longer program, like a seven year program, seven year loans. So we can perhaps not have to refinance as many later on. So that's something that we were asked to put together in the case. So is this, you'd be looking for new money to do this? Yes. Okay. We'd be looking for subsidy money to buy down the interest rate and then some reserves because this is a very risky, we're taking a great deal of risk already in our ag portfolio. So to take additional risk, we feel that we would need some reserve funding. Okay. So it's about $750,000 or something. It's not. Oh, that's what you'd be looking for. When you did it in 2009, was it the same? It was a million idea? dollars, and it was the same idea. But what that morphed into was this um, consolidation program also that came after the operating loan program. So there was a million dollars that was for the full program, and then there was another million for the consolidation program. I think right now we need to concentrate on the operating line program, especially if we can stretch it out. Maybe we won't have to do the big consolidation program, or maybe we'll do it. Maybe we'll be able to do it on our own. I can't guarantee that. Um, you're looking for the money. To, I'm sorry, I seem to be yes. sense about this. No. You're looking for the money. The money you're looking for would be to use to buy down the, the interest rate. Reserves and to buy down the interest rate. Two pieces, yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, um, right now you do operating loans. We do. And then you do, I guess, real estate loans. Is that what you call them? You know, Far mortgage, up. Mortgage and call. Yeah, we do. Yeah. I'm just curious, how much of is, what percentage of your business is operating loans versus the We've done a lot more operating loans of late. So, um, Jameson, what, what would you? I would say operating loans are probably at least 60, 70 percent of what we do. Um, the purposes of the farm, what we call farm operating loans, farm ownership loans, sorry, is purchases of real estate, improvements to real estate, including new buildings. Um, we can restructure debt uh, with a farm ownership loan on a longer term. Uh, we tend to try not to, um, to stretch out debt over 20 years. But, but that is a purpose. But most of the financing people have been seeking currently, recently is more working capital, um, restructuring debt on a shorter term, seven years or less, and um, making improvements for deferred maintenance items, machinery, equipment, or um, purchasing livestock. Um, and how, what kind of how big would those loans generally be? Is there a way to categorize that? Well, if you look at an average, it's probably around 150. But you know, you really should look at the median. And I'm sorry, I don't have that. Up there. Because um, some of the loans are large, um, a million, two million dollars. We can we can do it to the larger farms now. Um, so they really run the gamut from a loan for a tractor to a loan to purchase uh, to build a barn, let's say. Which, it does seem like it's kind of a challenge, given the state of the industry, to be somebody who's lending money you to bet. people who are told are losing money every day. But let me just say, as I said, I guess before Senator Starr asked about our loss rate, it is under one right. percent. Um, Seems impossible, doesn't it? <laughs> and you know, it's been that way for twenty years. Yeah. My my CFO keeps saying to me because I go in, oh, everything okay? In this way for 20 years, Joe, yes, it's going to get a little higher, but you know, we have the reserve. We can withstand that. What I don't think we can withstand is making some more riskier loans on top of it. And these are going to be risky loans because there are people that are already in, in a great deal of debt and have to pay off other things before they can finance their crops. Um, Leon uh, mentioned that the other issue outside of price right now is the significant decline in the value of cattle machinery equipment, especially livestock values, so in cattle. So 
if a cow was valued at two thousand dollars two years ago and see a cow now is maybe in thousand dollars or in a in an auction scenario even less than that and so um, it, it becomes difficult to lend against assets that have declined in value at least through the market and so a program that would help them maybe get their crops in the ground if it even allows a farm that knows that they need to transition out of milk production it maybe allows them the opportunity to get far enough along that they can do it with maybe a better market price for their animals instead of being forced to do it this spring when they really are not even going to pay down maybe their secured partners. And those asset values are directly linked to the price of milk and what's going on in the economy. So those asset values will come back up yeah. again when the yeah. price, prices improve again. The other thing I would quickly add that really helps us with our mission is partnering with with FSA, USDA, about 50 plus percent of our total just, loan yeah, portfolio, we have loan guarantees on, usually at about what the 85 percent rate. So that that helps us be able to stretch more than some lenders do as well because of that part of our portfolio that has FSA loan guarantees. I've been remiss, and I haven't introduced Cassie Delinas, who is our COO, who is in charge of um, lending. So she sees all the ag loans, and I don't know if you want to add anything, Cassie. I think, um, well, I think a, you know, a lot of it's been covered. Um, as Jameson just said, that the, the challenge for us is how to approach these higher risk loans when you know, the margin is not there on the collateral. Um, you know, we've got our underwriting our criteria and guidelines, and we're already you know pretty much up against those thresholds with without any kind of additional support and, um, and FSA helps um, but sometimes we're even at the limit of what FSA will do and uh, so you know some of these farms they may not make it maybe they want to get out but it's you know, as Jameson said um, if we can help with dispersing that sort of panic feeling that it oh, got to get out and, there's no value in my cows. Um, it, it certainly helps um, folks in Franklin County who are really in sort of a, an emotionally stressed situation as well. Um, you know, it's, you know, that's why we're here. What can we do to help mitigate all that that's going on out there in the sort of uh, psyche as well? Yeah, the emotion is, I think, the toughest thing to deal with. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, and I know that uh, I grew up on a farm. I've lived in Franklin County my entire life. And I, other times when these cycles come around, at least the community has been able to morally support farmers who are in their area. You know, there hasn't been this uh, criticism that you hear on the street, you know, the letters to the editor, uh, the, the meetings that occur uh, in the evening to you know, point the finger at farmers. You didn't see that until very recently. And um, I, I don't know what to do to stop that. I go to as many of them as I can, and I try to give the other side. But it's, um, in fact, the, the one group that I spend most of my time sticking up for are the farmers and the co-op. I don't think they know that. But um, I, I, everywhere I go, I try to, uh, you know, point out the overall benefit that these businesses create for the rest of the state of Vermont. The money that they bring in, um, the, the landscape, the uh, you know attractiveness, and the, the iconic image tourists have of Vermont is based on farming. So if we lose that, I, I know you guys all know this, it's going to be devastating, but especially for my county. Um, so I, I find that very frustrating. and. And I think it's a sign of how difficult things are overall. So what happens when farmers are leave, when they leave dairy? What do you see happening to the farms, to the land? I mean, is it, are they often bought up by the farmers, or is this just like that to you? No, it's often bought up by the farmers. Um, yeah, I would say typically um, the value 
oftentimes for a farm that goes out is in the land itself, not necessarily the facilities on that farm, depending on what those facilities are. Because um, typically the farms that are buying the neighboring farm are larger farms that maybe already have efficient facilities, but they're looking for more crop land, or they're trying to manage their manure and waste and storage. Um, so when those farms have been pulled out by the land trust, is that value still there? Doesn't some of that value go away because it's only available for agriculture, not for any other purpose? It depends on the type of easement, um, but yes, there are certain easements where um, there are options in place where if it's not purchased by a family member or another operating farm, then yes, it can impact the value of that property. Um, for, for the most part, though, Good agricultural land is conserved, holds its value, it, and it's continuing to appreciate its value. I'm asking because of the effect on the grand list, uh, and a lot of those farms are in current use, but if they're not being farmed, then they're going to get kicked out of current use. So, so if, if the grand list is affected by a loss in value of those properties, then we have a larger financial impact on everybody else whose tax rates then go up. You, you typically, just to that point, Senator, you typically find the better crop land either being leased to another farmer and you at least the way current use still operates, in, which is very important to rural landowners. If you have a multi year lease to an operating farmer, that land is still eligible for use value appraisal. So that's an important policy that we. Well, you know what? Most of the legislators here don't understand how important current use is to farming. And in fact, they don't understand how important farming is to the economic stability of the state. I, I, I'm often astounded at that. But there are probably a handful, outside the people around this table, there might be a handful of senators who really understand how important it is. This recent concern over water pollution is valid, but I think it's done a lot to run down the image of the Vermont farmer. And so we don't have that moral support, that background that the communities are willing to suck it up for a while for farmers to make sure they survive. That is gone. And so I am concerned about the impact. I also wonder if we can get 750,000. Yeah, I think, unlike Carolyn, I did not grow up on a farm. So until I served on this committee beginning with last year, I might be described as sort of a typical legislator here who didn't understand a lot about the agricultural landscape. And it's different than it was, and I'm going to depend on Leon and Joe and Jameson to give sort of a perspective that you can look back over a number of years, because I think that's important if we are indeed going to talk to our colleagues in the Senate. The landscape is different. There, there are fewer farms now than there were, pick a number, yeah. and yet we're making more milk. So that's one, so I guess my, my bottom line question is, and you've seen this for the 20 years that you've been around. Is this the low point that we've ever, ever seen? Or, and I understand we're in dire straits, and I think Senator Brannigan is correct that we, we psychologically have further damaged kind of a recovery process by, by wagging fingers a lot. But it is, psych it is cyclic. It comes in and goes. But is this a really, really, really bad situation we have now? Or have we been here before, I guess? We have been here before. Um, 2009 was, I guess, probably, at least to date, was the worst year that farmers had seen, at least in our modern lifetime. Um, 2018, margins are much better in Comorbid because are much better. However, we've seen less than sufficient margins to cover costs for uh, a long enough period of time so that it's really starting to impact the um, the balance sheet on farms uh, so 
Yeah, we're always going to go through cycles, as I talked earlier. You know, it used to be the three-year cycle. Now we're what what the other thing that's happening. We're seeing, and I think this there are other experts in the room that could opine on this, but we used to not see as quick a response to price as we see now on the upside. And I think some of that has to do with what happened coming off of 09 leading to record, record all-time high prices and margins in 14. Sure, we've got fewer farms, and if you look back from 1950 to today, through good times and bad times, we've lost between 3 and 5 percent. It's a straight line down. The other thing to look at, though, is that we're still at 2.6, 2.7 billion pounds of milk as a state. That, to me, is the benchmark policymakers have to look at as to the economic well-being of the industry. There are fewer practitioners, obviously, and that's going to continue. But the overall economic well-being of dairy is still strong and still a vital part of our economy. Uh, what we're seeing now, though, is that more protracted period of margins that maybe in the negative two to three dollars, and it doesn't take very long. And it doesn't take the, the the big farms do better, all things being equal, when prices are high because they take advantage of all those uh, things that big farms do. However, they lose money a lot quicker than anybody else when we're in a negative you know, pricing situation like we're in now. So it's not just the small farm, big farm <coughs> issue that we're dealing with right now. But it's uh, you, if you talk to farmers today, farmers would suggest this feels worse to them than 09. But I'll tell you, margins, income over feed costs in 09 went down to between 3 and $4. We're sitting in the six, seven, eight now, depending on, and the old break even, absolute break even used to be eight. Now some are saying it's closer to nine. So when you see policymakers talking about federal margin protection insurance at the eight to nine margin, dollar margin level, that's those numbers that, that they're basically referencing. But um, yeah, we're, you know, it's, it's cyclical, it's, it's difficult, uh, and we're always going to have cycles, and that's why we encourage our farmers to uh, employ risk management strategies too and forward pricing. The trouble is you got to take advantage of those when prices are high and that's the last time people want to spend any money exactly. on premiums to protect the price out in the exactly. future. So. When you, when you um, on any case, um, when you suffer injury and hardship and then have the opportunity to recover, you can do it. Then if you go through that injury and hardship again, and you recover, or have the opportunity to recover, you can do it, but you don't do it with the same degree that you did the first time you had to recover. Um, and so for that reason, I'm sitting here listening. I don't remember what year it was, 1984, 86. It was around 88, I think. Okay. Yeah. But when I became an honorary member of the Ag Committee in, in the House, if you ask me what did I remember, and it was this issue that we're talking about now. Okay. And, and can I just, to me this feels worse. As I look at the balance sheets of these farmers, I think it is worse. Um, Leon's point is well taken, but if you look at what's happened to the collateral for some of these loans, and you know, the farmers are going to depend on this at some point, and Hopefully they hang on long enough so that things come back. And as Cassie said, and I think Jameson, um, one of the things that we do, and I know this isn't what anybody wants to hear, but we will help a farmer get to a point where you know the cycle goes up a little bit, and then if he decides to get out, he can get out at a better price. In addition to which, you don't have everybody selling out at the same time. It, you know. Well, I think earlier <coughs> we heard that the I mean, price, that's an awful thing to say, but that is one of the functions. That the price of cows, what they were valued at, about half. So if you had, you know, a thousand of them, 
you know, you're, there's a lot of equity there, but if you lose half the value and now they're only worth half, kind of puts you in a bad spot without James, even James was telling us all about dead that. tell that. Okay. And, uh, you know, years back when we lost farms, a lot of times it'd be 50 cow farms or, or 60 cow farms. And now we're losing those, that middle range, that five, six, seven hundred. So when you lose that, you lose a big, you know, that's 10. <coughs> Ten little farms, so the you know the shock is going to be harder, and and uh, you know people don't come to Vermont to to see you know brush like they have in New Hampshire growing up in their fields. So they come here to see the open spaces and and the, you know the cows out in the pasture and. And uh, you know, we, we lose a lot more than just that farm if the farm comes in. Uh, that's, so anyways, um, we better wrap this up so these guys can go back and figure out. We <laughs> take <laughs> two or three minutes to talk to me right now. I sure do, yes. Yep. Um, Thank you very so, much for having uh, us. Thank you. I just, was in the hallway. I know with that. Commissioner, yeah. Secretary. Good. And and then, did that go well? Yes, yeah, Commissioner. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. uh, yeah. We've got so the good. administration yeah. helping That's to terrific. push the bus along. So that, that'll be Thank good. You. Thank you very much, everybody, yeah. for the time. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Probably. Uh, Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. Uh, We'd be happy to provide you with any information or come back or whatever you'd like. So uh, just keep well, us in mind. Uh, th thank, thank you, you so much, much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. We'll. Uh, <laughs> I, the only thing we got to try to figure out is how we can get this done sooner. Absolutely. And later. we're going to go back and actually we'll mock up all the things that we would need to mock up. Well, welcome. Uh, I know Brad and and uh, your Jonathan Chirbel, John Border Brothers, yeah, and Louise. Louise Calderwood with the Northeast Agribusiness and Feed Alliance. Yeah, and we've got our crew, uh, Brian. Brian Collamore representing the Rutland District. And Carolyn Brannigan's from up your way up in Franklin. Where's she from? Franklin. No, well, yeah, Franklin County. Uh, and I'm Bobby Starr. Francis Brooks, Washington County. Anthony Police, Washington County. Hello, welcome to the committee. And, and um, we're dealing with, uh, with uh, about 915, uh, the protection, pollinator protection bill. And, uh, so we, I guess we wanted to hear from you folks a little bit about treated seeds and untreated seeds. Uh, and we need a little education. All right, well, I may lead off. Pardon? I'm going to go ahead and lead off, and the three of us yeah. will be tag teaming this. We'll, we'll listen, try to get educated. Okay, all right. Yes, yeah, since I'm skipping my small business management class this morning, the students are very happy, so I'll educate you folks instead. Um, pollinator Protection Bill. First of all, we want to thank you folks. You have taken an amazing amount of testimony on this bill. Well-rounded testimony, and we really appreciate the time and attention that you've given to this bill. Uh, what we bring to the table, looking at the list of folks that, that you have heard from so far, are Jonathan and Brad actually sell the seeds, yeah. make the recommendations to the farmers, and interact directly with the farmers in the management of their land. So I think this is a very important voice that you have at the table, and we really appreciate the time. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is that we certainly have pollinators, a wide range of pollinators. Rat-tailed maggots grow up to be pollinators. Um, but with this bill, we realize that we are looking at domesticated pollinators, at, at the bee population. Bees are one of our oldest domesticated livestock, if you look at it. 
Um, and so we can talk about protection, but we can also talk about management. When we consider management of these domesticated bees as we would consider management of any domesticated livestock. And so in a management setting, we're looking at the broad range of management issues. Think of it, we've been sitting here talking about the dairy industry. It's no different than a dairy cow. Genetics, nutrition, overall health. We, we really need to be looking at the bee pollinator population from a management perspective. So with that, I'm going to pass this over to Brad and John to talk about their interaction with farmers, uh, the actual use and management of the seed part of it. Um, and then I'll come back around on some other issues within the bill. Yeah. All right. So if you don't mind, can I go first? Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess what I'd like to do is basically a little bit of groundwork you know, we talk about nicotinoids and, and their role on seed. Um, I guess I'd just like to talk a few minutes about some of the value, and some of the reasoning why we're here to talk about it, to try to preserve and, and, and have this as a tool for our producers. Um, back in 2006, a neighbor of mine uh, had planted us 70 acres of corn. And about three weeks after he planted it, um, we went out, we looked at this field. He was happy the week before. He said, this is a great corn crop. We get out there, only 70% of it's left. Basically, it's been cut off right at ground level, laying right on the ground, dead. Um, it was an infestation of black cutworm. Um, this was back prior to the, to the seed treatments being the way they were. Um, so, you know, he basically had to go in and replant that crop. There was no salvaging a 30% stand you know, the yield would have been well under 20% of what the potential was, you know, and basically that the ability for him the following year to take advantage of this technology basically would have eliminated that, that, that loss, that potential yield drag. So we're not talking just a little bit at the end of the year having, you know, a few bushels or a few ton difference. I mean, we're talking about some pretty substantial insects. Um, you know, we, uh, a little history on some of how that came. Uh, we used to use a general product, something similar like Lord's Band or something, where you would either broadcast that over the whole field, you would band it over the top of the seed. The product was used in pounds per acre. Um, and it was basically just spread out there. And then sort of that technology evolved into, you would take a packet, a little packet, a brand name was Kickstarter or something, you dump that into your hopper, mix it with the seed, and that's how you got your insecticide, fungicide control. Um, you know, and basically that was just a loose powder that it got dumped in, mixed together. And then they came out with these seed treatments where basically from the seed producer, they would come pre-treated with, with these controls. So, you know, the, the formulations when they first came out, they tended to be a little sticky and, you know, but I will tell you now, they have changed drastically. They're a lot harder coating. Uh, they aren't as sticky, but they basically have been able to refine their technology in how they treat these seeds uh, to better prevent the loss of what, you know, really the producer wants to be kept in the furrow. Um, you know, and so it evolved from a broadcast over uh, general application over the whole field to then getting put right in the furrow. So you open, the, you open a trench up, you drop the seed in, and then basically we're putting that product right in with the seed and then covering it back up. So it's not exposed to the surface. You know, there's a little bit of contact with maybe vacuum or things like that, but the technology has really come a long ways in, in basically protecting um, those species and those uh, plants. Um, you know, th they have a wide spectrum of control, whether it be wireworm, white grub, which also includes the Japanese beetle larva, uh, black cutworm, which I talked about with my neighbor, it major, major def uh, devastation. Um, and it has a broad spectrum of control that basically covers early season. You know, we're not looking for this stuff to carry it through the plant once it gets over a couple, three feet tall. You know, it's really for these early seedling issues that when the plant is really tender, and it's just no different than any other young livestock. You know, you can't overcome those early infestations, diseases, and insect damage. You know, it's really keeping that plant healthy from the very beginning. You know, and as we talk about, we just for the last presentation, um, how much farms have been put under pressure for water quality. You know, uh, they're being asked to do no-till, minimum till, 
um, cover crops, all these things. And there's one common factor that all of these things do. Leaves more residue on the surface and more insect pressure. Because instead of turning the ground over and burying the larvae and eggs and things where they can't come up, we're basically leaving it all on the top. So every year this is becoming a perpetual issue that, that producers are having to deal with. In order to protect the water, they're asked to leave all this stuff on top, which then just promotes these insects. And basically, the, the cutworms, the wireworms, all these things that, that affect early in the season are just magnified. So these nicotinoids have become really important in trying to combat those insect pressures in order to make these practices uh, acceptable or, or, or work for these producers to still grow and maintain uh, their crops. Um, and then we talk about new and emerging markets. You know, uh, there's, there's a new craze or a new word on the market, uh, non-GMO. Well, the only other option that these non-GMO crops have for protection is some of these early season uh, uh, seed treatments that allow them to come up. Because the other option is to basically have it in the plant, which will carry you later in the season, but doesn't always help early when the plant's young. Um, you know, and I'll just touch a little bit, Brad will go more into it, but you know, we've always had these options for non-treated seeds. You know, it's always been something that someone wanted it, we can, we can work with it. But there's a reason that this is such a wide adoption. Because basically, it is a risk management. You just heard it earlier with milk pricing and, and maintaining profitability and, and, sus and sustainability of farms. It's risk management. You know, it's that, you know, like I told you, my neighbor, that was a first year cornfield. Insect pressure is not usually an issue. You turn over the sod or you kill your sod from a hay field and you go and plant corn in it. That's the year you can expect that, oh, you know, it's kind of a gravy train. The insect pressure isn't there, but. And I just told you, you lost 70% of the stand that first year. So, you know, there's things that, that you can come up with to try to mitigate risk. You know, one of these is a very important, important part of it. So, yeah, I, I hadn't heard, I don't think before, that with no till, you've got all these little critters up on top that are running around. I don't, we haven't heard that, I no. don't think. Uh, well, that's because you haven't spoken to the fellows that are working with the farmers managing the crops. That's <laughs> well, we basically are asked by our, by our customers to come up with solutions. How do you, you know, as these practices change, you know, what do we do to still mitigate our risk? And, you know, this is definitely one of the major ways that we can do that with them um, and basically gives them options to still do non-GMO, do GMO, or do all of these different things that they want, you know, and, and ultimately they want water quality. So they're gonna adapt these things and we want it to be successful so that, you know, we can get our end goal. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Brad? Uh, to piggyback what John's saying, of course he's young and he has been around like some of us. <laughs> Before the seed treatments came out, we were buying trailer loads of insecticide. The farmers were putting the seed in and they were laying down a 10 to 15 pound track of insecticide on every acre. And I don't know what your perception is, but I'd rather have a seed in the ground buried than to go back to adding 10 pounds of insecticide right on the surface. And there are other products, you don't have to go 10, you go three and four or some other products. We definitely don't want to go back to that. The seed treatment of the old day, the farmer would get that, he'd dump the corn seed in the corn planter, he'd get the little packet of diazdon and lindane, everything's been taken off the market now, he's still got cat can. And he'd sprinkle it on the seed and he'd stir it around. Sometimes he'd do a stick, lots of times these farmers would come out and they'd have all purple hands because they got, well, they were gonna mix it up this way. So they were mixing all this chemical in, in, in the seed and that was, that's the way it used to be. Can I interject here? Brad is using the pronouns he. In 1991, I was eight months pregnant doing exactly that. Mixing the pink insecticide with the seed corn, with the stick, eight months pregnant. Now, you know, that kid's 26 years old now. And is he doing okay? Maybe not. He's or he may have been impacted by that. But it's not always he. It's she's out there doing that too. Right, right. Um, so I looked this morning, I, I do business with five seed companies. 
four commercial seed companies. The four major seed companies I do with, they have 343 varieties of corn seed available. 343 for four companies. And there's, I don't know how many seed companies are out in Vermont, there's probably 10. So let's just say everybody's got the same amount. Pioneer certainly got a huge profile. You know, I'm talking about Decal and Norfolk King and Seedway and Cropland. And I add them all up, there's 343 different varieties of corn seed that we have available for the farm for them to pick and choose or we advise to do that. All of these varieties are GMO varieties, non-GMO varieties, they're Roundup ready, they're BT resistant, or they're not. One thing they all are is they're all treated. 100% of them are treated they're seed. All treated. They're all treated seed, 100%. I've talked to all four of the companies, is there any option for treated seed? Untreated. Untreated seed, excuse me, untreated seed. One company says we can take the neonic off of one seed because we sell it in Canada. So we have one company would give us treated seed. It would still be a treated seed, it wouldn't have neonic. But it's the only one that's available. Um, the other, the fifth company that we deal with is an organic seed company called Blue Ribbon. I think Jonathan deals with it too. It's a very small organic seed company. They have 20 varieties of seed. They don't have any of the high tech stuff. It's old, old technology. It's old, old breeding. Um, I don't want to have to go to the farmer and say, well, we've got all this new technology, enhanced yield, enhanced feeding ability, enhanced standability, cold tolerant, drought tolerant. I don't want to go back and say, well, we're going back to 25 year old corn that doesn't have any of these new advantages that the, that the, the new varieties all have. Um, and those, those advantages a lot are just a result of traditional breeding. A lot not, of traditional, not some are GMO, some are, that's right. Some of the stuff is traditional breeding, uh, some of it is with GMO. Um, the, when, when the state wants to no longer have brown dirt out there in the fall, they want a cover crop on it. They want green, something growing on that field 365 days a year. Just like John brought up, that brings up a whole new batch of insect problems next spring. You've got soil that's growing in there, that's where they're overwintering. If you go into a no-till situation, it's very hard to get a, a insect control product down there. The only way you're going to do is you're going to have to do a broadcast spray. So you're spraying everything versus trying to concentrate it in on a seed or in a band. So it, it, it does create, you know, I remember when manure pits with a, everybody had to have a manure pit. And you had the empty manure pit, you couldn't start until the 15th of April. And it smashed up all the roads because we had frost in the roads and it was smashing up all the roads and all the town managers were getting upset because the roads were being smashed because these heavy manure one thing creates another issue. Yeah, this no-till thing is creating something like that. So to lose a treated seed now would be, I don't think it'd be a good idea. Yeah. Um, now, <clears throat> what about the, the one product? Do you have any requests for that one product? Only, like, only organic growers. I, I've, I've tried, I cannot remember and I've had it since 1986. I can't remember a customer coming up and asking me for untreated seed. I'm sure it's probably happened in the 32 years that I've owned the business, but I don't remember. Uh, and and the, the organic seed company is a small organic seed company. I, I'm one of the largest organic seed salesmen in New England, and I sell 250 bags. And I have a heck of a time getting 250 bags. So it's, it's, you know, your options are going to be incredibly limited if you do that. But, but it is available. So. Uh, what about the, uh, the product that they use in Quebec or Ontario with that neonic uh, I actually don't know. It's probably some of the old chemistry that's being used on that. I don't know. Or it's there. just a fungicide. Or it could be because, just a bunch of stuff. You know, that's right. the other thing that with these with these treatments, you're not right. only getting an insecticide, right. but you're also getting the insecticide, a fungicide, and now nine times out of ten, you're getting a biological right. already added to that seed treatment to right. enhance, you know, biological growth and activity around that seed root to enhance uptake of nutrients. So you know, all of those things are packaged together. Yeah. So you know, when you say untreated, 
you're not just missing the insecticide portion of it, you're also insecting the fungicide, which you all, as gardeners, must know, uh, damping off, fusarium, all those types of things that, that those seeds need when, when they get adverse conditions. You plant it, it's dry, beautiful, and with Vermont weather, you get an inch of rain in three days, that ground stays saturated, you know, you need something there to protect it. So the idea of just taking the seed treatment off brings up a whole other level of lack of your fungicide and, and these biologicals and other things that really uh, play a major role. And some of the seed companies are actually treating them with micronutrients, so you're getting beneficial zinc, boron, some of these other, are actually coating the seed with it, which has shown quite a yield increase. Yeah, we're really dr dr nailing down to those exact areas where you get that seed, it germinates in that root zone, it's the most efficient utilization rather than some of these broadcasts trying to get it. So if we, if we get untreated seed, then you treat the earth on top. But how do you treat the earth on top if you use no-till? Okay. Well, first of all, all the farmers that have taken off all their insecticide boxes, 20 years ago, every corn planter had a separate unit in the back of the corn planter where you dumped your insecticide yeah. and you had a T-bar and you laid that product on there. So first of all, all the farmers are going to have to go back to finding those insecticide boxes, which I don't know how readily available they are. When you guys, when you've got 12 row corn planters now uh, and much bigger, and that's very common now, um, there are some there are some liquid insecticides that can be mixed if you go in furrow or T band, which means you're you're putting a band right over that. So you're not treating the whole soil. You're put, you're protecting just the seed, right. two inches on both sides of the seed. That's what you're protecting from the insecticide from an insect. Um, you know, it's it's probably going to be a twenty-five dollar per acre increase. In product. The, in, in product cost to protect that seed versus nothing with the treated seed. There's no charge. I'm sure it's built in. It's in there. Yeah. But there's no, you know, here's untreated and here for five dollars more you get treated. You know, so there's no. It doesn't. It's not sold. At least in the company's idea, with don't break that down. But if you eliminate that seed, then you are looking at another, like I said, I don't know, twenty twenty five dollars per acre increase, and not as effective. And do you sell? Seed corn by the bag or by the pit? All by the count. By the count, yeah. Uh, yes, by, by the, the count. count. So every bag nowadays is 80,000 kernels. So a bag will plant about two and a half acres of corn. The average price of a bag, I'm going to say, is probably $250 is the average price per bag. So it's not a cheap investment for farmers. It's a major investment for farmers. Uh, and then if you said, okay, you know, so that's 80 bucks a, an acre for corn seed, and then you say you're going to throw another 20 for an insecticide on top of that because you can't use the treatment, you're still going to have to treat because you've got the fungicide problems. Regardless of the insecticide, you're still going to have to do something about treating for fungicide. And what would that do to the pollinators, the bees? Fungicide? I mean, the, the doing it on top. You uh, wouldn't be able to do a fungicide on top that no, but the, the neonicotinoids. The I, you know, I, I'm not a scientist, yeah. but just having it be on top, yeah. I don't think would be no. worse than actually having dirt over top of it. Right. I mean, that seed, when the farmer is done, 90, it's his goal is not visibly being able to seed that seed. He wants an inch and a half to two inches down, covered with dirt, versus a, an application of fungicide over the top would be on the surface. Or, or insecticide. Which is what we're really focusing on yeah, here. The yeah. insecticide would still be on the surface as well. Yeah. The other thing I might add too that all the seed companies that I deal with, we always bring in an extra twenty to thirty percent more seed than we've got ordered for, or that we think we're going to sell, or hopefully we can sell, because you never know what the spring is going to be. You can you can take corn out there to the farmer, and he thinks he's going to be in the field the first of May. And like last year, he got in the field the 10th of June. Well, the 100-day corn that he was going to plant the 1st of May went to an 85-day corn in the 10th of June. Well, guess what? I had to go back and get that 100-day corn. I had to bring him 85-day corn. And the reason that we always have extra corn is for that very reason, so that we don't have to wait for this corn to come out of Indiana or Illinois, so that we've got some on hand that we can do the substitution. 
Now the nice thing about all the major seed companies is that Brad Laws has got 700 bags of corn seed left over. Well, that all gets shipped back. I don't pay for that. The one exception is the untreated seed company. I own every bag, and that bag, if it's not used, I own it. There is no return for any special ordered seed, whether it's organic or whether you could call and say, I want 500 bags of untreated seed. The moment you say that, you own it. You don't sell it. You're sitting on it. So if you've got 500 bags at $250 a piece sitting in your inventory, Pretty serious. And the germination is dropping because we don't have control storage like all the seed companies do. And when that germ drops, guess what? You have to drop the price of that seed to the farmer. But 200 and some dollars a bag. How much is untreated? Uh, Your untreated stuff's about the same. It's all, it's all untreated all stuff. Oh, five bucks. Yeah, yeah. well, it, I mean, treats corn seed, you can buy different varieties of corn seed. You can pay 180 bucks a bag, or you can pay over $400 a bag, okay. depending upon the traits and the companies and all this other stuff. So it's, I, when I say an average of 250, that's probably about what it is. But you can easily spend over $300 for certain varieties of corn easily. This is done every day. I'll be done. So, <clears throat> uh, questions from me? Uh, do you, are you still using uh, farmers using much atrazine anymore? Or? Yeah, atrazine is still you know still used on a lot of product. Atrazine is a I wonderful. Say every acre. Of corn. No, not every acre. Certainly not. But it's it's one of those you know you got the headache you take an aspirin the aspirin helps. Atrazine is similar. You put a little bit of atrazine. The rates of atrazine we use are now in pints per acre versus. Again, when I was first started, we'd be doing two or three gallons to the acre. So uh, I think the message is it's an important tool. It is, totally, yeah. To still yeah. have. Yeah, it's still totally. a base. It's Wait. still a base to a lot of the chemistry. Uh, the, the other section of the bill that we'd also like to just reserve a few minutes for, let's make sure we get all the questions asked about the technology, because I think this is useful for educating you. But we would like just a few minutes to also talk about section four of the bill which is the study section, the Agency of Ag section. Yeah, uh, I have uh, oh, do you, do you folks get into uh, anything to do with uh, tile drainage? Do we have anything to do with it? Well, what we've heard in our some of our testimony is by injecting are using these treated seeds. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. Um, uh, that they're in the ground. And what somebody testified to, I thought, yesterday or one of these, is that if you test the outfall, you'll find some traces of, <coughs> of these chemicals going out the outfall from if corn's planted on these fields. And I didn't know if you'd heard anything from any of your farmers in regards to that or, or not. I have not. No. no. Um, Miner Institute just came out with a really, and I don't know if you've seen it or not, but they've come no. out with a two, three year tile study. And I believe, and I may be incorrect here, but I believe they touched on some of that chemistry that's out of that water. Well, we're going to have them in eventually. <coughs> we haven't heard from them. This. I just, because that came up in some of our testimony. Didn't know if any farmers had said, well, you know, I've got a little problem with it. Well, but you're also okay, so we go right back to the fact you want a treated seed. You want to put a seed every four and a half inches that's treated, or do you want to go back to having 15 pounds of insecticide laid on every yeah, I mean, and not have the same effect. Sounds like you do one thing to improve something, and then the something creates a whole new problem. So then you have to do something else. And and believe me, this cover crop that's being promoted has created a lot of other issues that the farmers are dealing with. Get and expenses, bugs in the air and stuff. 
Okay. And a question I would ask on the tile drains, if you do get a chance, um, if the neonicotinoids are, are being measured in the output from tile drains, is that output biologically, does it have a biological impact on pollinators? Uh, it's one thing to be able to measure something, and the other question is, is that, is that concentration that's found what is the impact? I, I don't know the answer to that, but that would be a question I would ask if I was we'll, sitting in one of your seats. Look at Miner over here, hopefully, before we... They, they do do a good job on their, uh, their analyzing and testing of drainage pipes. It's a very informative report that they presented at Miner about a month ago. It was really a lot of good information. Real recent. Uh, very. Yeah. Just as new. Yeah. Uh, you had something else? Well, I want to make certain you've asked all your questions of these fellows on the management of the product, because you've got them here. I, I just want to make certain all your questions are answered on that. Um, I, Brian, Carolyn, also. Anthony, you're good. Okay. Uh, Roxy, you're good. You're good. I'm good. You're good. Then the, the closing section of the bill uh, has section four. four. Yeah, it's section four of the bill, and that addresses the request to the Agency of Agriculture uh, for the study. And you've got Carrie sitting, looking right over your shoulder there, so I'm certain you can speak to this. But my understanding is that a number of the things that are being requested in this section are already being carried out by the agency. They could be carried out at a different level with sufficient funding but expecting existing staff to expand on that capacity uh, would only require the agency to move resources from other programs that are already in existence. So in order to carry this out at an elevated level is going to require existing staffing, which equals more money. Oh, it's going to require additional staffing, which equals more money. Um, the other piece to understand with this is that the agency, my understanding is, has the capacity when <coughs> the owner, you know, this domesticated livestock, um, makes a phone call into the agency with concerns around bees. The agency has the ability to work with them. Is the concern because of varroa mites? Is the concern because of forages, genetics, or pesticides? In the case of pesticides, I believe, Carrie, is it a 20-point protocol that you folks have in existence that you can follow? Yes, I, and I'll, I'll, it's on the House Ag website, but I'll make sure it makes it to this committee. Okay, so there is a protocol in existence. If, if, it, if in looking at the management of these critters, you're like, oh, gee, we think the issue with this hive is because of pesticides. Um, and then I'd, I'd like to go back again to some of my opening comments, and I know Brad has some, some thoughts on this as well, is that really we need to be looking at the overarching management, not protection. It's overarching management of these animals and all of the, all of the things that impact the well-being of the animals, um, of, the, of the pollinators. So I think just focusing in narrowly on the pesticides, the, the Pollinator Protection Committee, pesticides was number four out of their five issues of which they had concerns. Um, we just have a lot bigger issues to focus on with pollinator protection than the use of neonicotinoids. And you, you had some issues there as well as far as um, some of the language in Section 4 specifically. Well, that, I think that word contribution is a pretty broad word that can be used. Um, you know, I, you know, I'm just concerned that you could say, well, neonicotinoid contributed to the potential bee reduction. Um, I'm concerned that there's no limitation on that, and there may be no basis in science on that, but it may be assumed that it might be doing that, because that's what all the, the noise is about. Um, that, that would be my concern, is that you would come up with a decision not to use it, just be, you know, because that triggered that, con that contribution language. And no, no uh, usage of uh, a neonicotinoid means no untreated seeds. Is there 
No, I'm just trying to say if you, you said you were concerned about <coughs> um, how you affect the, the usage of the insecticide. Right. Does that then in turn mean uh, no insecticide, then you're limited on the type of seed? Well, a farmer is, if they got the situation where they had an untreated seed, they're still going to treat. It's going to be a different manner of treatment. I understand. Okay. So the only class of people that don't usually treated seed are the organic corn growers. And that's a very small portion of the, of the corn acres in the state of Vermont. So they get what they can get. And that's, you know, their yields are 50% of what a conventional farmer gets for, for yield generally. So sometimes there's some exceptions. Uh, but I, I guess I'm not quite sure what you're, what you're asking, but I mean, they're going to treat. If they, if they buy an untreated seed, they're going to treat it with something, and we're going to go back to 30-year-old technology in the way they're treated, which isn't anywhere near as safe for the farmer by any means. Well, or for the, or or for the insects. out for the environment. Yeah, or for the environment. Yeah. Yeah, you're spreading product on top of the ground, rather than coating an individual seed. So birds, uh, yeah. all kinds yeah. of animals yeah. could get into it if it's on top. Yeah. yeah, I don't know the biological activity of these products and other critters. Carrie would know that. I, I don't. Makes them grow healthier and stronger. No. We'll call it. There's got to be some positive outcome. I'm telling you, yeah. no. Um, so anything else from any of the members? That's sort of a quick thing. It's yep. sort of a comment, I think, might be a question. But Louise, when you were talking before, you used the word domesticated a bunch of times. And I understand what you mean. But um, I thought I had broader concern, not just about domesticated bees, but about you know wild bees. And right. And I, I think that we do need to be looking at the entire population of pollinators. Right. I agree with that. And um, I think my very opening comment was that pollinators, we, we tend to think of just bees. We've got a whole host of, of insects that are pollinators that aren't in the bee family. Um, and so it's very broad, which is why I feel that we need to be looking beyond just this, this very narrow segment of, of protection from one technology to very broad management. So I think some of the broader issues that have been looked at of uh, sufficient foraging capacity uh, for the wild bees, for the wild pollinators in general is very important. Um, but when we're looking at the domesticated pollinators, I think we need to be, I think we need to be broadening our management concerns. Hummingbirds are pollinators, aren't they? Bats are pollinators. Yeah, we've got a amazing list of pollinators. Yep. Anything else? No. You have anything else? So you you did testify you both have untreated seeds for sale if somebody wants to buy them. And they're five dollars roughly a bag. No, no, you can't say that because it, it, it could be a hundred dollars a bag. Cheaper. Cheaper, or it could be fifty dollars a bag more expensive. The the thing about corn seed pricing is, so the corn seed pricing is based upon what traits it may have. It's based upon when you when you're dealing with a hybrid corn, you're dealing with a, a male and a female that may produce a very, very small portion of seed. So these hybrid seeds, if you ever go to a seed foundation and you see these seeds, the, the, the corn, the kernels that we're planting are coming off these little dinky ears, all deformed and everything. It's terrible. I mean, you, you think, how is this going to produce me a decent year, a decent corn? But that's the way it is. So, so if you take a, a farmer in Indiana who was producing 250 bushels of corn per acre, if he does foundation corn, he may be producing 50 bushels to the acre, 30 bushels to the acre, 20 <coughs> bushels to the acre. So for that farmer to grow that crop, 
that's producing 20 bushels the acre. The seed companies have to pay him 10 times the value because that's, if he went to commercial corn, they have to make sure his income is adjusted. So some of that comes into play with the pricing of corn seed. So you can have, you can have a corn seed that has the same traits, whether it's Roundup ready, whether it's conventional with no traits, that can be $50 difference in price because of what the availability is. Yeah. So, well, untreated seed isn't necessarily cheaper. Like I said, I can sell you a full treated with all the goodies in it for 180 bucks. It's got some other issues with it. Or I can sell you untreated corn for $225. So in that situation, it's $45 more a bag. But if you were to take a specific variety of corn seed and buy it treated untreated, would the costs be a few dollars less for untreated? I per doubt acre, it. it's probably I doubt it. I doubt it. I doubt it. Because I, I, first of all, they're not going to give you that option. They're not going to. It's only going to be It's only going to be a limited. It's only going to be a limited number of varieties. So a farmer may not be able to buy the best variety. And we don't know when we go to the farm. We. Speaking for myself, but I've, of the 343 possible varieties, you eliminate some because they're too early or they're too late. You eliminate some, or we certainly eliminate some, because I'm not going to try to sell a $350 bag of corn seed because most of my clientele is in Addison County, or in Rutland, or in Addison County, it's heavy clay, and they can spend $350 for a bag of corn and still get 12 ton of corn silage. Well, you take that same corn seed and take it over to Connecticut River Valley and they're going to get 25 ton. So our clay has limitations. So we try to make sure that we don't say, you need to buy a $300 bag of corn because it's not going to make any difference on your yield. So it's it's not, everything's not black and white. You know, it's not like, usually is. it's not like more money is going to give me more yield. It doesn't work that way at all. So we try to screen everything and, and say, well, here's, you know, here's, 30 varieties that we think are appropriate for your area. And that 30 varieties changes from Addison County to Rutland County to the Connecticut River. Jonathan has different varieties than I do, you know, and something hey, like that. 30 day corn. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell the sweet corn guys he's got that. Frost comes late and comes early too. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, uh, anything else? Don't lose it. But I, again, I just really want to thank you folks for the time, uh, for, for listening to the people that are actually working with the farmers to manage the crops. Um, well, thank you for your time. I mean, your time is probably a lot more valuable than our time. Well, this time of year is, but it will be shortly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good to catch you early. <coughs> and, That's right. Uh, the farmers usually do their seeds uh, in the fall or winter? Or when do they usually order? Uh, it varies. It varies a some lot. Some producers are right off on it in the fall. Yeah. And some producers are, yeah, I'm going to plant next week. Can you bring me some corn seed? Yeah, or I just pulled my planter up today. And now, oh, I'm going to have corn seed to go in that corn. <laughs> we probably sell 20%, 30% of the corn that we sell. It'll be the day they pull the corn planter out. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's unfortunately, yeah. yeah. And so that's and that's another reason why we've got to have an inventory there. Now we start taking the seed companies give tremendous cash discounts, and they obviously got a margin in that they can do that. So they give farmers tremendous cash discounts if they'll order their seed in September or October, November, December. They'll pay. They'll give them cash discounts that you know we pass on and we send to the seed company. So it is a whole range. Majority of the corn is majority is ordered before March. Yeah, oh, right. Yeah, it would have been ordered last month. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, you know, there's also a big chunk. The good progressive farmers will usually order in the late fall. And again, because you're dealing with a variability in supply, if you've got a really good variety, well, everybody else knows about that really good variety, and that supply may not be available if you wait until March to order. It. You know, it's it's. You know, we've we've got some some new stuff coming out now that the seed company is doubling their production every year for seed production, and they're still sold out. 
And so there's new stuff coming in. That's why inventory and all this other stuff comes into play. We, we order the, the day that the seed company op opens up its order book, we block order a lot of corn seed. Yeah. So that we try to get what we want. And, and all you and have it. Yeah, we yeah. have it. Yeah. And what, I, you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to or if you can. I was wondering, what do you find uh, the well-being of our ag community in your two respective counties? Do you hear anything on? I think this is. Price and milk? I think this is the worst depression that I can remember. We, the farmers, this has been for me personally. This has been the slowest two months, three months that I've had since I've owned the business from memory. Farmers aren't even calling asking about prices. They they are just they they're in shock. They don't have a clue how they're gonna do it. I just had one of my salesmen text me out there that one of our farmers is not gonna plant corn next year because he can't afford it. He owes me twenty five thousand dollars from last bank. Uh, you know, he gave me a five thousand dollar check, he's not gonna plant corn this year because he can't afford it. I, I mean I think it's as bad as it's ever been out there. So Brad, I'm I'm just gonna I'm gonna lead you a little bit here. Um, in 2009, mm -hmm. the price of milk was low, mm -hmm. fuel and fertilizer were a whole lot higher mm -hmm. than they are this year. Mm -hmm. um, so the margin that the farmer had in 2009 was a whole lot worse than it is this year. Yeah, the price of milk is low this year, but fuel and fertilizer are pretty darn cheap. But all that, they had 08. Yeah, that's right. They had 08. So, so my question exactly is, right. we have not had anything good since 14. So that's my question, is so, what makes it different? So to me, that's the big difference. That's why I, everybody tells me it's worse. No one said, ah, yeah, this is, this is. No, it's, it's worse in the fact that, that they have not had good prices Four since 14. Years. And so, you know, guys in 09, it hurt. Expenses were high, cash flow was was non-existent, but they had just come off of good. So so the, you know, now these guys have not, and it's it's I hear it worse. Most all the farmers are on cash basis, so the year end they'll prepay for some of their grain, prepay for fertilizer to get their profits down, so they don't have to pay up the sand. I normally have thirty. To 35 prepay accounts. We give them, a, we give them a, a cash discount for paying ahead. We give them a very good price on that. So I normally have 30, 35. This year, two. Holy smokes. Two. Well, <clears throat> and that's the way it is up there. We haven't um, we haven't progressed to the point where we're in good shape, but we are working on a program. Uh, the legislature and the governor's office to try to make some money available so that maybe that guy that called and said he wasn't going to plant corn might be able to, uh, if we can get our stuff. Can I get it quick? Well, that's <laughs> it. We, we, we've got to figure out how we can do it rather than waiting until we do the budget. Um, that, you know, I had a call last week, first of last week, not kind of getting off here. Good farmer. He says, I just got my milk check for last month. It's eighty-four thousand dollars less than it was a year ago. Same number of cows, same quantity of milk being shipped out. Eighty-four thousand dollars. That's one month that he's down. Yeah. Those are big numbers. Yeah. No, so anyways, yeah. thanks a lot guys. Yeah. Uh, if, if, you know, if you think of anything we should know, feel free to sure. call yep. any time. Thanks for the invite. Yep, and uh, thank you, Louise. Yep. Thanks. Appreciate it. Bill, did you have something? Well, the only thing I was going to say about what changed, you know, we've been in a three-year cycle since 2000, and every three years we see that cycle repeat itself. And 2014, we had a big year. But I think that was an anomaly. China went home with their checkbook because they overbought and they packed their warehouses full of powder and everything else. And, and they left and they, they didn't entirely forget about us, but they didn't buy a lot from us for a couple of years. 
and we got hung out there and we had a 17 percent export market and we've got all of these big dairies geared up to produce where is that to produce for the export market and without that export market you look at it like this for example uh, last year this country produced 215 billion pounds of milk and with a 17 percent export market it worked but with a 13 percent export market take four percent of 215 billion pounds that's our excess how did that happen russia had its trouble with ukraine the west imposed sanctions Russia closed its door to the West. The European Union, the EU 32, they produce 360 plus billion pounds of milk a year. That's 32 countries, 360 billion pounds. Russia was their chief export market. So where did all that milk go now that they gave up their management to wherever it could find a home? Some of it came here. So that really, that really hurt us. So now what's changed? We're not sure. We now know that it's not a three-year cycle, and we're not sure how long the cycle will be. And that's why the farmers are nervous. How long is the cycle going to be? We're, we're, we're having talks with Mexico and Canada over NAFTA. Yeah, you like fighting with them. And, and the president isn't, uh, he, he's not willing to entertain negotiations too far, I guess. But uh, that could have a real adverse impact. So well, if you really, lost both of them. Well, it, it, it could come down to the point where that uh, it could destroy the industry in this country. People wonder, because in Quebec, I, I talk about Quebec, Canadian farmers, right across the border from me, you know, they're, do, they're doing good. But I was, and Americans don't realize that the Canadians buy a lot of stuff from dairy stuff from us they do. it's amazing the thousands and millions of pounds of product they buy from us but they keep their market tight so their farmers do do fine yeah. they, they play some games those guys you live so close to the border you must be able to hear the frogs sing oh yeah yeah i thought so yeah. Sure. go out and sit on the porch and listen yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Uh, Aaron, we got Aaron here and Peter. Andrea's on too. Yeah, I'll, she's dead. I'll take thirty myself. seconds about the pollinator bill. Uh, if, if you have thirty seconds for the pollinator bill, I'd like to just offer a couple of things. Yeah, that's all for it. I know that these guys are waiting, and that's an important thing to do. Um, thank you. Um, You've heard a lot of testimony yourselves. I've heard even more, some of it repetitive because I heard it in the house as well. We're living in a world of bad choices at this point. Yeah, it really bad choices. Really bad choices. Um, we have worked ourselves to a place where we are having to balance this against this, and neither one is good. Um, a couple of points I wanted to respond to. We, we do need to look at this holistically. It isn't just about managed bees. And managed bees aren't like cows. They don't stay put. You know, they, they, they go places. They, well, they, they forage. And you don't know exactly where they're going. You know, they know some things about how far they go and stuff. So they're exposed to a lot of things in the course of, of flying around. And we have all these other pollinators, um, not just bees. Um, other creatures that pollinate. And we also have this very complex web of life in the soil, in the water, that is very much a part of how agriculture works, how we produce food, how we maintain our landscape, how we you know, have a lot of the things that we think are important. Um, and I think the one thing I would say is Let's focus on long-term thinking, not short-term thinking. It's really hard to do that because there's a lot of short-term immediate crises looking us in the face, the economic crisis, the water quality crisis. But if we don't stay, start thinking holistically and long-term, we will, we will steal the future from those that come after us. And I don't think we have the right to do that. 
I don't think we do. I think we have a responsibility. So I would ask you to do that, and I would offer you just two things. This is H688, which was the original pollinator protection bill. As you think about what you're going to do, there's language in here that you can just pull right out. You don't have to spend a lot of time because it's already been drafted and vetted and all that stuff. So I would urge you to, I'll give this to Linda and she can make copies for anybody who wants. And then if you haven't had a chance to look at this, this is the Pollinator Protection Committee's report. It's really comprehensive. They put an enormous amount of work into it. There were a lot of really smart people with a lot of experience who contributed to this. So there's, there's resources here too. And the last thing I would say is the two things that they you know, they recommended very strongly was to ban the use of neonicotinoids on ornamental plants. That's not agriculture. That is another. Is that that's, that's in the bill? It's in the sure. bill. Yeah. And to designate neonics as a restricted use product, so that only people who have the training and know how to use them are using them. And I think Carrie's idea of a public information campaign and so on and so forth is really important because it's very true that a lot of people out there have no idea um, what the impact of these chemicals may be. So I would just urge you to think about those. Is that in, the, is that in either 688 or? It is, it is in 688 and there's, there's not language in. about this in, in, in 915, but I think, I think going as far as banning the use on ornamental plants would be a really good step. Yep. Okay? Thank yep. you. Thank you. I appreciate the time. And would you like me to leave these with Lynn? I know she has access to them, but I have them right here. And I'm happy to give them to her. Why not? For sure. I didn't kill the trees by making copies for all of you. I didn't want to assume that you'd want to read them. Yeah, we love them. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That copy room. So much fun being in here. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'll show you places. Helps the logging industry. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so if, they had, if they had a place to sell paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> six, six, uh, three. Um, I know, Aaron, you had a few things you were going to do for us. Yes, sir. Um, so maybe we'll. We'll move to it. We're going to hear from you first. Thank you. We've got copies. Aaron Adler, Legislative Council. We've got copies of a committee draft for H663, draft 3.2. So, there's a couple there. Anybody else interested? Here, if you can take one, I just want to take a little. I think I'm giving them all right now. Um, so, uh, this makes a few changes that are bolded from the last draft that you saw, which was 2.2. Um, first change is on pages, page four, up to the top of page five. Uh, this, the last draft, sections three and four related to both to Act 250 and would, would have amended this Act 250 statute to say, go ye and adopt a simplified application form and then had a schedule for doing that. Uh, this is the alternative suggestion made by Chair Snelling and um, my understanding is the NRB is comfortable with this language. Just section three would say simplified application report. They asked for on or before January 31st of next year, submit a written report on its plans to design and implement a simple, simplified application under Act 250. The board shall submit the report to various committees listed there, including this one. So that's, that's the change that I have made. And then the next change is section four, which is um, in the Peters area of current use. Get out of the hot seat and let him get into the hot yeah, seat. That's unless Peter's you have questions section. on section three. Well, why would you swap sections? Uh, because I know Act 250 and Then we would all be in the same boat together. Okay, next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. <clears throat> that, um, appreciate that. That sure. works to me good. Does anyone have any questions for Aaron on this? 
not on what he did, but I did have some notes back on page two. Okay. But we might not have actually asked for you to work for that. So I, I don't know that we did. About the overnight stays, rephrasing it to farm stays and no, yeah, we were oh, I didn't know about that anything like that, but I can Okay. Wait, okay. I'll I'll up here. So you want to have Peter first and then we'll well, there's just uh, farm stays is a phrase that's used on a lot of different things. And so we'll do Peter and we'll okay. come back. Okay. Peter Griffin, Office of Legislative Council, here to talk to you about section four on page five. Um, this language might look a little different than what you were expecting to see. The last time I was in here, um, uh, I had language that kept the current definition of house site, but then added some specific instances where um, additional houses and dwellings would still be included within a single house site. Um, since the last time I was here and now, I had a talk with Doug Farnham uh, from the tax department, and um, Doug pointed out that use base definitions like that are a little tricky in current use. And if you remember, the, the uses were you know uh, within a certain distance, 300 or 100 feet, if you're a farmer, labor housing. He said the problem is that that, that language would have worked fine uh, the first time it needed to be implemented somewhere. So you had someone come to your, your committee who had four or five dwellings in a small area. And they were, the question was, do you need to take 10 acres out, or could they all fit on a two acre house site? So Doug said that kind of use based language would work for an instance like that. And you could um, have all the dwellings be on a two acre lot. But then if that person ever sold that business, and the use of those dwellings changed, they were no longer being used for an accessory farm uh, business. The question would come up well, we need to take eight acres back out of current use. And when you take eight acres back out of current use, because now it's not being used for a farm business anymore, it's being used for something else, is the land use change tax due on those eight acres. And the land use change tax is 10% of the fair market value. Um, if those eight acres are right where the home site is, it's prob they're probably eight relatively attractive acres, and it could be a bit of a, a liability. So uh, Doug and I talked a little bit about, well, you know, one option you had is you could try and tinker with the definition of development in the current use statutes and the definition of in the, in the language of the land use change tax. But that might be getting a little broader than, than what I understood the committee to be looking for. And so, um, so what I talked with Doug about, and, and I mentioned it to yesterday to Senator Starr, was um, the tax department said that they could take a crack at uh, tackling this problem through regulation and then come back to you guys in January next year and um, show you what they've got. And if, if from your point of view, what they were doing was problematic, you could consider a legislative fix at that point. So what you now have here in, in section four, this language that's requiring tax department, I'll just run you through the language real quick. The tax department uh, shall adopt rules regarding the definition of house site under statute to ensure the two-acre exclusion is applied consistently and equitably to parcels that include more than one house or dwelling. And on lines eight and nine, the rules shall specifically consider the application of the two-acre exclusion to farms with on-farm accessory businesses, and then it just sets a date and who, who gets the report. On or before January 15th, 2019, the Department of Tax shall report to the Senate Committees on Agriculture and on finance, uh, and the House Committees on Agriculture and Forestry and Ways and Means. Thank you. <clears throat> so, what would happen? Could you talk to well, Doug's right behind you now? So. Did I talk to him directly? No, just I wouldn't want to know that. I'm oh, sorry. <clears throat> I wouldn't want to know if you talk to Oh, oh I'm sorry. I thought I heard someone come in, and then I didn't see it. So, uh, okay. uh, I'm just wondering what might happen to 
the situation that we already have at hand yeah. uh, uh, about having to remove those those five extra five acres from ag to from somebody's requested that that the sheep place the land place got to take five more acres out of the farm and put them with those old cabins is that going to be on hold until we get this report back or I I, I wouldn't know the answer to that question. I mean, I Doug would know that answer. Doug would know the answer. Why don't yes, you right. sit right up there, Mr. Chair? Sure. Yes, Mr. Chair. You two have been conniving. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> trying to figure this situation out. Uh, so, <clears throat> I, you know, I, I like this idea to let you guys try to figure out how to deal with that. The only concern I personally have is, is what I just stated. Right. So what will we do with the guy's five acres? So for the record, Douglas Farming Policy Director and Tax Economist. Um, all right, so to answer your specific question, what we, well, with a generality. Yeah. So um, what we generally do when we have an, an appeal where uh, we are not, we are, we are aware that there is a legislative change coming up or a regulatory change being considered, we will generally hold that appeal process. So we may not require that um, removal from, from the brand list, so we would keep that open. So the hard part with current use is that because it's, everything is isolated to each grand list year, a decision has to be made in December. Is it in or out? Um, to finalize the grand list. With an income tax appeal, it's not pleasant, but we can hold it open for longer uh, legally. We don't have a specific date where we have to drop that other than statute of limitations expiring and our authority to pursue something expiring without a judgment. Um, so our policy is that when we know that we are looking at changing something and we have a related appeal, we would we would hold that appeal. So, so the this what we have now, what you folks came up with in section four, would give you until next January to come up with a sort of a little plan to how to deal with this. <clears throat> it would allow the on farm. Uh, stay people to maintain their little cabins as they are and allow the five acres that's in ag to stay in ag until you come back with this report and we determine if that's good, bad, or, or different. Uh, correct. There would be one necessary adjustment, which I didn't have time to transmit in that um, the rulemaking authority in this wow. situation is actually with the current use advisory board. Um, so we could be charged to work with them, but they do own the rule and we'd have to work through the advisory board to achieve it. So right now the language yeah. says the tax department shall come up with the rules, but what you're saying makes sense to me. It needs to be the current use advisory board. And it has to be a rule. It can't be a practice or or some other issue that you use in in tax to to decide something like this. So um, that's a difficult question, Mr. Chair. Technically speaking, because we have conflicting superior court, you know, trial court. Uh, decisions related to this matter, the department could decide to change direction without putting it in a regulation. Um, I think from a good, good government perspective, uh, we would prefer not to do that without, because of the, because of conflicting trial courts, we prefer to give it public comment period. Um, and that could go on for another year after next. I'm not running out of years here, but so I'm getting at the point. <laughs> Wouldn't that take another?
another six or nine months? Um, coincidentally, our new PBR director, Jill Remick, has actually had luck in the past shepherding things through the RCAR LCAR process. She does have experience um, updating regulations from her time at the Agency of Education. Yeah. Um, so we are optimistic that while we, while we haven't always been good at maintaining the status of our regulations, we do have expertise in place right now that will help us move more quickly. And we do recognize, um, as the policy director for the department, I recognize the current situation as creating an absurd policy outcome. And that's what the, drives the courts mad, that's what drives legislators mad, and that's what I want to fix. Yeah. Well, I, what's the committee think about the, this direction? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. I don't have a problem with it. Um, Anthony, good? Yeah, good. <coughs> There are associated per diem costs with calling that board together. Right now, it only meets twice a year, so the cost of that board is is negligible. In order to move this through, we would need to meet at least a couple more times, uh, maybe four meetings or five meetings in a year instead of two. So there would be a de minimis cost um, to to calling this board together to try to get this regulation updated. Yeah. Um, Do they work on your issues? This board, where do they? Do we have to appropriate money for them to, or do you pay them out of tax? Or I, <coughs> I don't have complete certainty on that. I believe that we pay them out of tax. We're charged with administrative support for the board. But you can call the meetings if you need it them anyways, right? As long as we convince the chair. Um, uh, there was recently a new chair appointed by the governor. So as long as we could convince him to call the meetings, then. Then yes. Thank you. So just to clarify, what will happen is in the middle of January on the 15th next year, this group will come to us. It's us and Ways and Needs in the House. Senate Committees on Agriculture and Finance. So it's the same committees on both sides. House and uh, Agriculture and Finance here, and then Ag and Ways and Needs upstairs. So you're going to bring those four committees, your, your report on how these rules should work. So does the legislature have any say on changing them at that point, or is that going to be what happens? So the way it's going to work, the way it's going to work is they're going to come, the way I see it working, is you're going to come to us with this suggestive changes, and then you would write the rule next after are we going to look at those proposed changes before you go so so just to be clear um, the language you have before you says no it says the power taxes but um but Doug's actually right it needs to say um, the current use advisory board um, will promulgate rules and then it says you're going to get a report back on the on the substance of the rules so on the rules adopted. Yeah. Not the substance, but on the rules themselves. So that's it. There's no change. Right. So 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 just to be clear, it wouldn't be a matter of the report coming with proposed rules. This language is saying go adopt the rules and then come back and tell us about them. That way you could have an opportunity to pass legislation if there was something problematic from your point of view like on what they came up with. Well how but, but it, 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 and you jump through all these hoops 
how how was that going? Uh, I mean, were it just that all of our bucks on on you or on the board chair, the brand new board chair to fix this, and then we're going to come back and pass a bill if we need to. If you need to, yeah. I mean, or if there were some changes to how they were proceeding, that was problematic. That is how that. That's how this language works. You can set up. Why you ask backwards? I'm saying that's a point. It, it is, but in terms of timing, yeah, it gets to what we want to do faster. I think, it, and I'm getting nods there. So, in the case of this gentleman that we had in, you're saying that you basically put everything on hold until the rules had been adopted. And then they would go into effect whatever rule that was, and then we would have a look at that rule after the fact to decide whether we wanted to modify it or not. If you do it the other way, he won't get any relief until Next. we've taken a look at it, and then it gets back and it kind of, we skip a step, I think. Oh, it would be quicker. I, uh, I don't even question that. Yeah. Do you think, do you think the board and the department could put together something to figure this out so it's going to be minimal to both sides? I would say that, that passing a regulation, getting a regulation through the process in six months is um, extremely aggressive. I think that we can do it and if not we can report back on where we are in the process but obviously I would I see the need to have this done before the end of the year so that it can affect the proper grant list. Yeah. Um, there will be the, the LCAR stage in the process that the legislature will definitely uh, have a point in which to... They'll push it right to the And they always have very few questions. And with our regulation updates recently, we have been going above the Secretary of State rec minimum requirements for notice. And so we would make sure that all of these four committees had seen a copy of the regulation yeah, before we even submitted it to the ICAR yeah. process. Yeah, they'd send us a copy. Right. Yeah. Good? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay. What about you guys? Yeah. You Washington County guys, what do you think? This is all taking place in Washington County, so yeah, we, I mean, we, we don't mind. You guys can keep, well, keep a close eye on it. That's right. You made up your mind now? No, I haven't. Oh, okay. You made up your mind. Well, why don't we, you'll fix that language change. To make it to reflect the board. Yeah, and, um, I and then, uh, I, have a, I have a different question when you have a chance. On, on, on this part? Or yeah. on the, no, the different part. Okay, we'll get, get Aaron. Twister. We'll get Aaron back in the chair. Thank you. 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 Yeah, well, one through five, actually, but whatever. Oh, I think it's the first sentence. So, um, okay, so what this means is that if you have an accessory artifact, okay, back up. This provision amends the planning and zoning chapter, so it's about municipal zoning. And this is as it passed the House. Um, the, overall, the, what's going on here, just, just as a refresher, is um, the House is proposing to um, say you can't prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting an on-farm business earlier on in this language. This language permits limited review of the accessory on-farm business. And maybe what it says is that if activities of an accessory on-farm business that are not exempt, because there are, there's stuff that on the farm that's exempt, from land use regulation, farming is 
not something that's regulated by local land use. But if but accessory on farm businesses may be <coughs> that aren't part of that definition that may not be exempt. They may be subject instead to site plan review. Site plan review, um, if you were to go to section 4416, is about screening, landscaping, traffic, circulation, parking, signs. So um, it's usually regulation of specific things like that. It's not the same as conditional use review, which deals with whether something fits with the character of the area. It's, it's a site plan review is usually fairly limited. Um, and they would not be exempt from those. Right. Well, so if they, 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 the municipality may could, require them okay. to, to go through site plan review. But can't, it can't say no. It can say only so much parking or put your sign over here, or mm -hmm. move your lighting over there, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then it does say in the second, you, you, did you want to, you also asking what the second sentence yes. was? Okay. Um, so a bylaw can require that these activities meet the same performance step standards otherwise adopted for similar commercial uses. So. Today, existing law allows a municipality to have performance standards for things like noise um, that can apply to commercial uses. If the municipality has adopted performance standards for similar commercial uses, they can then apply them to the accessory on farm business. So you could say, well, so if there's a noise standard in town for commercial uses, you could apply that. But the way it's worded is also to avoid having them do performance standards that are solely for trying to zone these things out. Right. So, it's, so, so it's, there's, a, there's a nuance in the wording. Because yeah, generally what the bill is saying is that the town cannot develop, um, the, bill is right, where the town can't have restrictions on these on farm. Well, it can't say, it can't prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting. Right. Which isn't quite the same. I'm interrupting. I'm sorry. No, but it's not okay. It's isn't quite the same as having zero restrictions. Through the site plan review process, you could have okay. some conditions that might affect, you know, how, how big the parking. But they can't be prohibiting them outright. Right. Or it can't have. If your restriction is so restrictive that it effectively prohibits, then I, that would that also would be a problem because it's not just it's not that they can't just they can't prohibit. It says if you go. Page one, it says, no bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting. So it's, it's worded so that to try to give the farm operator the ability to say, well, that restriction is so much that I can't operate, we can't do that to you. Okay. Do you have any suggested changes, Anthony? No, I just, it was just helpful to talk through. Yeah. And back on page uh, two, yeah. Um, I think it's probably down on line 10 or someplace. Uh, yeah. You got an overnight stage on line 9? Um, yes. Um, yes. Um, well, then we'd have to we'd have to put that. So instead of overnight stays, we want farm stays, right? Yeah, I'm going to yield to if I can to Andrea because I think she came up with sort of the language here. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Palmer and Senator Starr, Andrea Standard Rover Vermont. Um, just to be clear, this is this this section, Roman numeral two, mm -hmm. is probably, in our view, the crux of a lot of what this bill is about, which is defining what can and can't be an accessory on farm business. And I've been in communication with the group of people who participated in coming up with this to begin with, and we're working on some new language. And I had talked with, we were supposed to come in with it today, and we asked if we would come in on Tuesday, just so that we could make sure that we could run it by all the people who had had a stake in this to begin with, and make sure that we were getting it right for as broad a swath of the folks who, who have been concerned with this as possible. So I apologize for the delay, but I think it'll be worth it because we'll be able to give you something that we can say this whole group of people is is okay with and, and good with. 
because it, it is it is pretty critical how this all plays out as far as what's in and out of consideration. And we tried to make sure we're checking in with a lot of people who've got more experience with both existing accessory on farm businesses and people who are thinking about. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that you haven't heard about is the survey that we did um, when it was being when the bill was being considered in the house. We did a a quick turnaround survey and we got a huge response. We got almost 400 farmers who responded to it in a matter of days to give us a sense of where they were at with interest in accessory on farm businesses and how many were already doing it. And if it would be helpful on Tuesday, we can bring that information in as well, um, just for your consideration in terms of the number of people who are interested in this and the types of things they're interested in. So if, okay. if you're willing if you're willing to give us till Tuesday, I can bring you language that I'll has tell been you, you're that, running out of Tuesday. I know. I know. <laughs> I just hope it will save you time because you'll have the confidence. You can have the confidence that it's it's widely supported. We gather. Yeah, okay. Uh, so given that what you just said about timing, it's what should I work with Andrea with like when she has language just to get it in yeah. what, as, if as you close. had it on say Monday you got squared away with these folks? Yeah, might even have it tomorrow. <laughs> you could okay. give that to Aaron now. Okay. So he Absolutely. could work on it to present. Yeah. Yep. Um, that would be Thank you. better yeah. if you could. Yeah. Um, and we weren't going behind your back, Aaron. We were just trying to get our ducks in a row. No, I, 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 dad I, I didn't. No, I actually just wanted to make sure they were okay that I go work directly with you. Yeah. Right. I, I figured you would say yes. Well, I'd I'd say she was working on your back. <laughs> you well, she is behind my back right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anything else on 663? Yeah. Everybody's, everybody's happy. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so, so if that, if that works out, uh, and we are, yes. uh, you know, try to get. Yes. I'm hoping that even by tomorrow cooks. I will be able to do yeah, something. Yeah, they got the old saying, too many cooks spoil the soup. I absolutely agree with you there, Senator, but we did have a group of stakeholders who put a lot of time into developing this, and I think on balance, after the fact, it will be better to have them all on board than to have people saying, wait a minute, I didn't hear about this. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't sign up for that. Well, push them. I will do that, sir. Yeah. I will do that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Oh, we. I'm glad. I don't see a man about a horse. Yeah. <laughs> well, we take our breaks. Um, so, um, I guess that's all there. Did you have anything you wanted to offer? No? That's Harvey Smith's granddaughter. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I She's been know. here for years. <laughs> been coming so here she since was a she was. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And are you just here visiting, or? Yeah, I was here with Farm Bureau today for the Young Farmer yeah. program. Yeah, so so I guess as you're you're thinking about some of the dairy policy, some of the dairy funding, and some of the issues we talked about earlier this morning, um, you know, just consider the fact we we're trying to bring up. You know the young farmers also so we want to make sure that it's possible for generational transfer for young farmers to be buying some of the farms for some of the older generation that is retiring that doesn't necessarily have the next generation um, so in order to make sure that we're putting farms in financial situations where we're allowing that next group to come up and be involved and continue for sure yeah. is definitely something well, that's great. Um, yep. Do you do you just volunteer that time, or do you work for Farm Bureau? Uh, volunteer the time as the chair. Doesn't wow. have much bread on the table. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm only up here every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, we eat your beef upstairs, and that's always good. And, yes. And uh, so that that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, why don't we? Well, thank you very much.